coming from a lot of different aspects. Uh, I do run the Dark Ridge Observatory. I designed it, I built it, I operated it uh, myself. Max is 7,100 feet is my elevation, and it's in the south central mountains in New Mexico. Uh, I'm about a stone's throw away from Apache Point and Solar Observatory down there. Uh, it's a really nice location, and I'm just very, very grateful to be able to have that. Well, tonight what I want to talk to you about is 50-50 was what Max introduced me to. Well, when I was 50 years old, I could do a lot of my work. <coughs> Let me go ahead through my slides so you can see what's going on here. Uh, Max says I was in submarines. That's yes. absolutely correct. Um, I was in submarines for uh, about uh, 13 years. Uh, after that, and well, first during that period of time, is where I learned technical uh, information about system integration, uh, about uh, you know uh, mechanical, electrical, electronic systems type of stuff. But also after that, I got out and went to work at the Alba Canyon Nuclear Power Plant as a maintenance supervisor and uh, an operation kind of guy there. I did that for 10 years and got a little tired of it, so I went into the programming industry, and the same company, Pacific Gas Electric Company, out there at the Alba <coughs> I became a senior programmer uh, writing software. So all of those neat things put together kind of naturally led to, hey, I don't have to stay up at night. I can automate my observatory, get a good night's sleep, and I can still go to work. Okay? Well, that kind of grew. It kind of grew pretty fast, actually. This is the kind of stuff I'd like to talk about real quickly tonight, and please realize this. We don't have time to go through a full, I'd love to be able to put on a full, you know, half day or day workshop on remote observing, uh, robotic observatories, that type of stuff. But this is what I'm gonna fly through fast. And, and if you have questions, please jot them down or something. I wanna answer them at the end of the, of the, of the quick presentation. Um, I think I was given 45 minutes roughly, plus or minus to, to, to do some Q&A. So I'm going to run through this pretty fast. But this is what we're going to talk about. I'm not going to go over a whole bunch of these terms and definitions and things. The top statement is absolutely true. I am not the expert on robotic, robotic or remote observing. Okay? I've got a lot of experience. I've put a lot of systems together. I kind of consider myself, I say a hack, because I can integrate stuff off the shelf or I can make write my own software if I need to to make things work. But really the fun to me is putting it all together and making the magic work. Okay? That's really kind of fun. Who in the audience has an observatory currently? How many of you do? One, two, three. Okay, I see about three. Any of you have a remote observatory? Uh, someplace by remote, is it in your backyard, but you don't want to go out to it? <laughs> Let me tell you what, my observatory in, in New Mexico, my <laughs> four observatories built currently, and I don't like to go out to it. I really don't. I'd rather sit in my living room comfortable run the systems either automatically or remotely, you know, how I wish to do that. Uh, and that's kind of what I want to talk about tonight. It's, it's not that hard to get yourself set up with a remote robotic observatory where you can do some fun things. Okay, I want you to be thinking about this bottom statement as we talk about things. What is it that you would have to do with your equipment to really trust it, to be able to say, I can leave that stuff all night. No, I can leave that stuff all week. Now, I can leave it for six months and not worry about it and, and be confident that I'm going to be able to have an operational observatory when it does it. I'll tell you what, that's a really tough task. That's a tough task if that observatory is 30 feet outside your house in your backyard or if it's 10,000 miles away like my observatory down in Chile is right now. Um, think about that for a few minutes as you go through things. Okay, quick terms and definitions. Everybody knows this. The important thing here is ASCOM. We've, we've We've developed our software, we've developed our hardware integration now to the point where it's kind of plug and play, which is a beautiful thing. Used to be you had observatory uh, equipment that was one manufacturer, one camera would go on it, one software package ran it, and you were stuck. Well, this, this opened everything up. This opened um, uh, uh, ASCOM, which is Astronomy Common Object Model. If you're programmers, you know what common object models mean, whatever. This is the glue that puts it all together and makes all these manufactured products work together and we're getting more of them on board all the time. It's a wonderful way to do that. Okay, quickly, a couple of terms. Synchronous systems, asynchronous systems. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm talking down to you because I don't mean to, but I want to get some fundamental things in, in place, make sure we all understand. A synchronous operation is something that has to complete before the next step is. Okay, you got to have that system, that operation, whatever, finish 
and then the next one in line takes over. Opposite to that is asynchronous systems that they're not time-based. They don't really matter when they finish as long as they do finish and report that they've finished. There's usually some overarching program that runs the things. These are ways that we integrate our hardware or software through uh, computer uh, programs to effectively operate our systems. They both have their place in an observatory, I guarantee you. It's not one or the other, it's a mix. Okay, open and closed loop systems. Now this is kind of important because, and again, these all have their use also in your uh, observatory systems. You use both of them. An open system is basically one that doesn't report back on itself. It's just a, I'm gonna send a command out for sprinklers. Great example. You got a timer on your sprinkler. It says at noon, I'm gonna turn on for an hour. So it turns on. An hour later, it turns off. Well, it didn't know if it was raining. It didn't know if you were, you know, if you had a huge puddle of water out there, it didn't know. Open systems are good for a lot of things when you've got simple processes or well-known, well-defined processes. For example, you've got a focuser and you know when you have a five degree temperature change down, it's going to change your focus by X amount. Well, if you know that, you can automatically scale it and you don't have to have a report back that says, yes, I'm at that position. That's one option. Now, your closed system is just the opposite of that. It's a loop. So when a process says, go do something, process says I'm doing it and it tells you I'm done and it says this is the result so you can automatically adjust things. That's pretty important. That's kind of the basic way auto guiding works in telescopes. It's a closed loop system. You set it up, you set it on a star, you say auto guide for me. It takes a picture, it goes up, your little auto. It tells the program, move. So you move the scope, comes back around, takes a picture, there you go. That's a closed loop kind of system. And they both have their, their places uh, in, in the observatory. Okay, here's the big thing. This is a fundamental question you always need to ask yourself if you plan to build yourself an observatory. And it doesn't matter if it's a remote observatory, robotic observatory, or just like my first one, go out in your backyard, slide your roof off, open your scope up, and have fun. What are you going to use it for? What's the intent of use? Uh, you need to know that from the very beginning because it's awfully easy to design or over-design at the beginning. It's awfully expensive and rough to go back and retrofit. It really is. So kind of think about those things. Even if you know you're not right now going to do something if you're observing, plan for it if you ever think you might. I mean, because believe me, you probably will. And that's, that's the fun part about this kind of stuff. Okay, projects like observatory construction and design, you, you sort of get into, hey, what do I want? That was the first question. What are you gonna want your observatory to do? Well, if you're a real expensive organization with a big budget, you do something like this, you hire yourself a project manager, you put together your Gantt software chart, you go have a bunch of meetings with the project manager. He's usually telling you you're behind or you're over budget or something. Well, I'm sorry, I'm an amateur, and I'm kind of like more like the bottom section that says, hey, I got myself a real nice telescope for Christmas. Well, what can I do with it, okay? So we don't have the, the, the latitude and, and we really can't afford neither the time nor the money, excuse me, the money to go through that big project management process in most cases. But do it. I'm telling you to do it if you're going to build an observatory, even if it's just on a scratch piece of paper. And refer to it as you're going through, along with your goals for the observatory. Because you only get one chance to do it right. You really do. Okay, you need to think about your site elevation. Um, in my case, I really don't have a big problem. I live on a ridge. I'm about 250 feet above the, the the uh, valleys down below. I'm at 7,100 feet and I've gotten pretty decent scenes and whatever. But would you like to elevate your telescope? Maybe you need to get it up just a little bit to get a little bit of thermal effect from the ground go away. Think about those things before you build your observatory. Do you have a sky or a horizon limit? Uh, is there a big tree over there? If you just raise your scope a little bit, you can actually get down and you can see Omega Centauri. You know, I mean, that kind of thing. So take some time, characterize your site, go out, sit in it. Sit in it multiple seasons. Make sure you look around and see what you got going on before you, you break ground and build yourself a real nice observatory. Okay, so another thing you need to know, and you know, believe it or not, I didn't just put Dallas in there. That was that's the way I feel. I mean, if you're in downtown Dallas, you can do wonderful science. Don't ever think you can, because you can do great science in downtown Dallas. Any big city you can do it in the middle, middle of town. Or do you have, like me, my nearest neighbor's about five miles away. And I don't really have a lot of problems. Here's a picture from my all-sky camera taken last week in between the monsoon rains and thunders and lightning. 
this is north, this is east, to give you an idea. You can see my sky horizon. I'm, I can go down to three degrees above the, the horizon, 360 degrees. Over here is the interesting point. This is a light dome of Juarez, Mexico, looking through El Paso. It's not a very big light dome, but it's, I mean, it depends on what you're going to do. If you want to shoot a target that's over here, good luck. You know, I mean, you just got to kind of characterize your sight and see what's going on. So if you can actually, if you can get yourself up above some of that tree line around, get yourself a little better sink, you might get some good thermal effects. But do characterize your sight so you can see what it uh, really looks like. Um, that's, that was really a picture, just one frame from Wild Sky the other night. Okay. Uh, next thing, operation modes. Okay. Now, one I didn't put on here, which I think I really want to talk just a little bit about. That was what I first said. I, my first observatory, I used to go out and latch the roof. I used to roll the observatory <coughs> top back. I used to bring my scopes up and start them up. And I would, I know, I would put an eyepiece on those things. I never do that now. But I would actually put an eyepiece on it and enjoy the night sky. You know, there's an awful lot to that. And don't ever think there isn't. Um, I've recently decided that while my automation stuff's going on, you know, I've got a couple of small telescopes I take out to the star parties. I'm going to set one up and actually just put my eyeball on it and enjoy the sky again. Don't lose, don't lose sight. If you go robotic mode, do not lose sight of the night sky. There's so much wonder out there, really. Okay. Um, then there's the remote manual. Remote manual is just, it's that. It's, it's like wire, wire guided flying, okay? You, you have to be able to connect your telescope usually through a computer in your observatory and it can be done with a desktop software, remote desktop kind of software. It can be done from inside your house, 50 feet away. You can do the same thing at 10,000 miles away. In fact, it's fundamentally the basic uh, way we roboticize the scope. If you can remote it, you can roboticize it. It's just a matter of putting software in place to manage the scheduling and manage the, uh, the, the information coming in and make good smart decisions. If you do robotic, which is where your targets are basically queued up, you've got a, a lot of things to think about. You've got to think about, okay, I'm not going to be there. Who's going to take care of the camera? Who's going to get me the right filters? Who's going to do all that type of stuff? Um, when you're doing the remote observing, remote being wire guided where you're controlling that computer uh, at the keyboard, you can kind of change filters, you can adjust your exposure time and all that kind of stuff. You don't have that luxury, and you really don't want to take that luxury when you do robotic observing. Robotic observing takes, takes the middleman out, takes me out of the picture, which is usually 99% of the time a good thing, because it's, it's us, it's us nuts that get to the keyboard and mess things up. I guarantee you, if you had a nice program going, I hit the wrong key or I get the wrong exposure time or I put the wrong filter in or something like that, you know, I'm going to ruin my night. I really would. Okay, so talked about cameras, talked about filters and exposures, that type of stuff. Uh, a lot of the scheduling uh, software today on the market, off the shelf, has a really wonderful scheduling engines in it. All you have to do is basically send it a list of the things you want it to observe, give it a list of filters you want it to do, uh, exposure times you want it to be uh, uh, to take. You want to say, okay, stay away from the moon. I don't want to get more than six degrees away from the moon. Um, if my, my particular target is going to go down before, or I can't finish my exposure time before, before morning, before dawn, don't schedule me that one. Anyway, there's a lot of good things you can do with, uh, with scheduling software nowadays. And you can write your own. I, I started out writing my own, um, and I do that with two of my observatories now. Uh, the one I'm, I'm most functionally uh, involved with right now is called the APAS. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But that is uh, off the shelf. By, by design off the shelf commercial stuff that we can integrate. And I'll talk about that. Here's some things to think about. You can, you can read these, oh, by the way, uh, when I'm done with the discussion here, uh, this will maybe show up on the past website, and I'll put some additional papers, uh, giving some limited references for hardware and software, that kind of stuff, very limited. Uh, and I'll also toss a couple of other presentations that I've done in the past that people want about like flat fielding and that kind of stuff, right? that have done uh, professional uh, presentations at uh, some societies. This will be there. Okay, so we talked about scheduling. There's dynamic scheduling. Dynamic scheduling to me is the most important part. And dynamic rescheduling is even more important, okay? So I've got a dynamic schedule that said, go to this particular object, take this, because I'm interested in science. But now I get that email that comes in, there's a GRB, uh, the, you 
know, there's a gamma ray burst that went off over in, uh, in, in Scorpius. What, what am I going to do? Well, dynamic scheduling says stop your program, go over to it, it's a high priority object. You've already pre programmed in the filters you want, all that fun stuff. It takes those images and then it says, okay, I'm done with that. Well, now what happens? Do you pick up on the object you're on? Do you go to the next object in the list? Uh, no. A lot of the engines now are smart, they're dynamic recycled, they're able to actually go through, figure out the best objects to start at with now, proceed through the rest of the night. So software's come a real long way. Okay. Um, config scheduling, that's wonderful, especially if you're doing things like supernova uh, surveys. If you're going galaxy to galaxy to galaxy looking for the, the little leap that's not there, you put a, str a fixed list in and it goes A, B, C, D, and it's done. When it's finished, it puts itself to bed, it starts up the next night, does it again, and maybe you get lucky like 10 bucks. Okay, so this is a picture uh, of uh, APAS, twin astrographs, down in uh, CTIO, uh, Sertololo International Observatory in Chile, at La Serena, Chile. This is where I've installed that one down there. And it sits, in fact, in one of the, in one of the prompt clamshells. Prompt is a uh, University of North Carolina's project going after the GRBs, <laughs> interestingly enough. But uh, that's the way that, that, that system looks down there. Um, another very important thing to know is who's going to be using your, your system? Is it going to be a single person programmer or is it going to be a shared? Are you going to open it up to let people you know, use your system? Uh, I, let, I let the university students occasionally uh, use my systems for gathering data for papers, uh, a lot of research papers that they've done. I think it's a wonderful way to allow uh, student education uh, just to evolve without a lot of cost. I do all that stuff for gratis. I just say, you want time on it, you just you know, schedule it out, we'll, we'll get you in place. I also help them write papers, um, do that kind of stuff, as a mentor, which is really, really wonderful. I've got a lot of students that go on to work in places like JPL and stuff like that because they've done papers with the, the equipment that I offer. Okay, here's a good one. Um, do you rotate remotely? got a rotator on your telescope. Well, you know, if you're going to have a real nice, uh, pretty astrophotograph, astrophotograph and you're done, you want to make sure that the object is correctly rotated, right? Well, let me tell you something. Rotating your cameras when you're doing science is just a really big pain. Because as soon as you make any rotations, now all your flat fields are gone, all your, you know, you have a bunch of things you need to do to compensate for that. But you can take that into account. In fact, many scheduling programs allow you to at the end of your program, dynamically uh, get your calibration frames and take care of that. So it's not that big a deal. But here's something that is a big deal. You have to compose your image, no matter what it is. If it's a science image or if it happens to be uh, an astro a really nice astro uh, photograph you're going to be taking of like F51, for example. You want to make sure you've got that correctly uh, captured and also, more importantly, that you've got good guide stars. Because most of us don't have equipment that can guide five, ten minutes uh, Without without auto guiding, it just can't track that well in a lot of cases. Okay, so you have a good uh, guide star over here, and if you have a German equatorial mount, <laughs> you got a guided star over there because you're going to flip halfway through. I guarantee it's going to be the worst time you're going to you're going to go. It's going to happen halfway through your image. You go, oh rats! I hit I hit my flip one. I I, I either stop my imaging or I flip and I start again. Well, if you flip, you better have a good guide star over there, and your software better be able to recover. That's not a trivial thing to do for software recovery. And many packages don't really do that very well. I want that thing there, but if I flip, it's going to be over here. Now, how do I get the system to drive it back over? Yeah, we've we got to kind of build that into the system. There are some packages that will do that and they're quite expensive. Um, so, guide stars, guide stars on both sides. Okay, I do have the luxury. This is a five minute unguided with APAS. Uh, it was unprocessed as well, unguided. Um, this is the Orion Complex M42 running, and you can see what's there. Um, but the point is, I've got a wonderful field of view. I've got guide stars over here, guide stars over there. Anything I needed to do to set my science frames back up or my um, camera back up to take great uh, astrophotographs, uh, you can do that right there. So we don't all have that kind of field of view. That's about a three degree on edge field of view, by the way. Okay, um, shelters. Not observatories, just shelters in general. And this is, this is a very important thing to talk about. Um, especially nowadays with the economic situation and the way things are you know, kind of up in the air with, uh, with uh, unemployment and all that kind of stuff in a bad way. And I say that only because 
your shelters, you got to make sure that they're kind of theft proof. I mean, uh, really, that's a big key thing nowadays. Um, you drive down the, the highway on the other side of my observatory, down the Highway 82 New Mexico skies, you go down that road, you look up on the hill, there's these beautifully polished, you know, domes. There's rows and rows and rows, and they got these big green dollar signs painted on them. On the side. <laughs> my observatories, they look like sheds. They look like roll off, they roll off. All of mine are roll off observatories, but they do, they look like farm sheds. And, you know, if somebody looks at that, if they can see it from down there, which they really can't very well, but could they, they would go, eh, there's nothing there for me to worry about, I'm okay. Okay, weatherproof. Yeah, you gotta keep your equipment dry. Debris proof, yeah. Here's one you can't do, you can't critter proof it. I don't care what kind of observatory you got, you cannot critter proof it. You're gonna get something in there. So I think the best you can do is just take all precautions you possibly can to protect your equipment individually. Um, you know, people talk about putting steel wool in holes and mice don't come in, that kind of stuff. It doesn't work, I guarantee you, I got proof. I think most of us do have some kind of proof about that. So just do the best you can with that. Here's we talked about. Here's something else that's real important. Uh, Site-wide webcams, if you, I mean, even if it's mounted on the top of your roof and you're looking at your observatory, it's only 100 feet from your house. You know, there's a real comfort zone and comfort feeling when you can look at your monitor and go, there's my observatory, it's all operating fine, life's good. And it doesn't matter if it's in your backyard or like I do down in Chile, I look at that one every night I'm during well operation. Webcams are important not only outside but inside. And webcams, um, not just webcams, but webcams that tilt and pan, they're even better. And if you can get the good ones nowadays that have the two-way audio, you can hear that Paramount when it homes. You get that beep beep, you feel real comfortable about that. Or if it doesn't, it's going beep beep, beep beep, beep, you know you got trouble. Okay, so I mean, those are really good things. Um, observatory isolation and low thermal mass. I'm gonna talk about low thermal mass first. If you can do it, you know, you get a lot of heat generated, especially in our areas in the Southwest. You get a lot of heat during the day. It takes a long time to, to cool off a large slab. You know, even if, it, if you're at the dark side, you've got all those wonderful slabs by the mouth that put your, your telescopes on. It takes a long time for those to cool off and thermally equalize at the end of the air. If there's any way you can move air across it or do like I did when I designed mine, I had to put two large slabs in because I've got a 20 inch Richard Crichton and a 24 inch shot. Um, classic cast, it, they're huge. The, the, the cast is a 7,000 pound telescope. It's called the Morgan, came from Lowell Observatory, and um, I'm running for the AVL. So anyway, I had to design that correctly when, before I even got the equipment. So what I did is I installed underfloor radiant tubing to run cold water through to remove heat from the, from the concrete. Think ahead, that's the whole idea. Think ahead, what possibly could go wrong? That's the key to a good observatory construction, whether it's manually operated, remotely operated or robotic. Just try to think ahead and everything you can possibly think about. And you know something else? Don't think alone. Ask your buddies. Share your information. Um, you, you can toss an email out nowadays and say, I'm thinking of doing this. This is the equipment I got. Do you see any problems with that? And you know, the community will come back to you a hundredfold. Great ideas, I guarantee you. You're gonna get some, some bad ideas too, but you can kind of do that. Now. Okay, isolation, vibration mounting isolation. This is a couple of pictures. This is, in fact, this is where the APAS in, uh, in my observatory sits right now. I have a real interesting uh, uh, situation there. You can only dig about that deep, two or three inches down in the ground before you're in solid rock. Okay, so I can't really dig a big pier, right? If you're in sandy soil, you better dig yourself a real nice pier to mount your telescope on, you know, or else you're gonna have some issues. But there's other ways to do it, like I did. I went down, that, that tele uh, pier is three feet in diameter. It goes about two and a half, three feet down in the ground. It's I've got rebar driven into the mountain, epoxied in, and I've got the concrete around. It gives me both a, a ground for lightning protection. It gives me a ground for system ground. It gives me a lot of good things. But it didn't have to be very big. Also, right above that is uh, bolted on this, this pipe. Most of them are this way. Most, most of our territories are bolted. Over. That's a Schedule 80 uh, 10 inch uh, pipe, not that big around. But it's, uh, notice it's got isolation around from the floor. Now, my observatory is. Uh, I only go out there for maintenance or something goes wrong, so I'm not there. Vibration in the building, I don't care. I mean, it doesn't vibrate unless I'm opening or closing the roof. Uh, you're not going to have people walking around. That's not true if you're going to have students and things up to your observatories, or you're going to invite your neighbors over for, you know, put your eyeball on it. So you're going to want to make sure if you do build an observatory like that, you give yourself plenty of room down here. 
I, since this uh, photo was taken, that was back in 2007, that's gotten wider and it's also got a nice rubber uh, uh, seal in it. So you, know, you, you get the critters that don't come up, but you still get the isolation. Think about those kinds of things as well. Um, okay, mountain power. Uh, everybody's mount's different. You know, if you got the, the Cadillac, you got a Paramount out there, you got that really nice brand new AT, what did I see, an AT 5000 now, so they put this big 24 inch scope on, I couldn't believe it. Anyway, if you've got the, the, that kind of mount, wonderful. If you don't, like a lot of us, I've got two Mead LX200s, uh, along with the other scopes I talked about. Um, how does it wake up? How does it wake up when you power it up? What does it do? Do you know what your mount does? I mean, you really need to know what it does, especially if you're going to operate someplace away from your house. Even if it's a half hour drive from your home, that's a half hour you're going to have to drive to go fix something if you don't know how it works. So know that. How does your, how does your mount wake up? How does it come out of hibernate? How much weight do you put on it? Uh, you know, is it nicely balanced, all that kind of stuff? Is your mount going to be overloaded with what you plan in the future to put on it? Not what you have right now. What you plan on it. I started out with a, my little 14 inch meat. I didn't think anything about that. Just the meat scope. Well, then I started getting into science. Well, I need an auto guider because means traditionally they don't track super good. You really have to auto guide them if you're going to do like long exposures. Then I got an exoplanet work and some eclipse and binary work. You got to track them all night. So you add that that guide scope. You add a camera to it. You add a whole bunch of other things, counterbalances, and you decide, wait a minute, I want to learn about the spectroscopy. So you pop the camera off. You put a spectrograph on, which is a big moment arm. Anyway, think about the weight you're going to put on your equipment. Think about your growth. Uh, before you go ahead and design your system to include the mount. That's pretty important. <coughs> Cabling. Um, you're not going to have probably the extreme amount of cables that I've got running through my APAS system in north and south. But uh, you're going to have cables. You're going to have a camera cable. You're going to have maybe a guide scope cable. You're, you're going to have um, auxiliary equipment. You may have 12 volt DC up there doing something like I do. For example, I run 12 volt uh, uh, banks of lights called uh, uh, grains of wheat, tungsten lights, that's my flat field lights that ride with the telescopes on the end of these um, uh, uh, they're new caps, excuse me. So I have 12 volts up there. But where are you going to run your cables? Are you going to have any kind of issues? going to run to the mount? Sounds like a good idea. And in many cases, it is a good idea if you have a limited amount of cables. If you're going to put a lot of cables in there. I have 12 cables running through this one. I've got 14 down to CTI running through. What happens to cables when you start working them over a period of time? You're not there, by the way. You don't know what's happening. They start twisting up inside the mount. They become um, snags. They become really difficult. So it doesn't mean you can't have that. You just have to take that into account and give it the extra room. You've got to secure things where they need to secure. And most importantly, you've got to test your systems out over and over and over before you're confident in them. Um, this particular system here, I uh, tore down and took down to Chile after I proved it up in New Mexico. I went and took it to Chile, and then I built a whole replacement new one down in my place in New Mexico. So cabling through the mount, here's a picture of the cables. You can see all the cables, bundles coming through here. Now you can only see, I don't know, maybe about nine or ten cables coming through here. But there are, there's 12 cables on the one down in Chile, and I think I said 10. There's 10 in New Mexico here on this one. So think about cable, cable wrap. Of course, I'm going to tell you what, your mount, uh, through the mount cabling, is you know, it's 90% is better, in my opinion, 90% better than having that one cable coming off the camera that you didn't know was there that's going to wrap around something that's going to gonna stall your motors. If you're lucky, you've got something that will trip your motors off and not damage them. If you're unlucky, you're going to burn out boards and motors and you're going to be down for a long period of time. I'm telling you, watch your cable wrap, real important. Okay, park is really important too. What's park for? Everybody has a different reason for parking their telescope where they do. Maybe it's because I'm done for the night and click go in. Maybe it's, gee, you know, I have to worry about where my telescope lies because if I don't park at a very specific orientation and I close my roof up and I'm not there, that motor could wipe my $12,000 camera off the top of the telescope. That's my case on, on, uh, on an APAS. I'm done. There's also the, the capability of, well, gee, let's park it so it's very convenient to do my calibration frames. I can do them anytime I want to part of APAS as well. Um, then there's, gee, maybe I should park it not facing east. What happens if in the morning my roof doesn't go closed and sun comes up? Now I've just 
burned holes in about everything I can imagine. <laughs> but think about those things. You know, I mean, these, there's some little things we don't really, you know, think about until you just sit down and look at it. Think about it. What could possibly go wrong? Make a checklist. I bet you your checklist is going to double by the time you finish your observatory. What, what can and did go wrong? That's the way it happened for me. Okay, this is the way I park my scope. This happens to be a pass north. Um, these are my flat field screens. They're very special uh, flat fields. But I have to park the telescope so it's over and under like that, facing dead north. You see that camera up there? That's an Apogee U16M. Uh, it's a 4K by 4K, real nice camera, um, TC cameras. And I've got one hanging down below here you can't see. This is a twin astrograph, twin, uh, twin uh, uh, camera system with you know huge filter wheels and everything else on it. When that roof goes closed, I have an inch and a half space between it and the roof taking it off. <laughs> okay, now wait a minute. Sounds bad, doesn't it? It's robotic and remote. What happens if the scope doesn't park? Well, I've got software interfaces in place, interlocks. I've got hardware interlocks in place. Limit switches don't click. The roof doesn't close. I would rather have it not close, believe it or not, and get a little bit of moisture in my observatory than have it take the top of that OTA disaster trash from ASA off <laughs> and that camera with it. I can replace some of the <coughs> It's not like throwing away $30,000 for one OTA. Okay. Park. Very good. Pointing models. Very important if you're going to do PDP. Everybody know what PDP is? Photoelectric photometry. It's, you know, I want to say it's old school way to do photometry. It's not. It's really sort of mainstream as well today. I don't think it's not. But what you have to do is you have to put your star very accurately in a very small aperture disk. And there's, a, there's an electron uh, counter back here, a PMT, for a multiplier tube, that reads the, the flux. Then you have to move that telescope very precisely to your guide star. These apertures are, are, are only like three times the full with half max of your star. They're very small, so you need extremely tight pointing. Um, think about that. You're going to have to have a really great pointing model. And most software today for your telescopes can provide a nice pointing model in them. Uh, so that, that really has become much easier than it used to be. Um, yeah, how does your mount recover on power interrupt? Well, you know, back to park, those mean telescopes I've got, they're, they're nice, they're very nice optical instruments, but when you park those telescopes and they hit park or remotely you send a park command, it goes to wherever you designated all does, and then the little pan control pops up and says, now turn off the power. So you have to be there to turn the switch off. If you don't, the drives keep going. And it, and it keeps going, and it doesn't have any way to stop that. You're going to burn motors, up, you're going to burn boards up, unless you get that power switch off. Okay. And we'll talk about power management too in a couple of minutes. Here. But uh, how does your uh, scope recovery on, uh, recover on power interrupts? Okay, um, we talked about peers. Now, many of us don't need one that goes all the way down to the middle of your like I talked about. Uh, however, if you're going to have a robust system somewhere that's remote, you really want to beef things up. You know, you spend the extra money to find that site first off. You might as well spend a little extra money to make sure you're almost bulletproof. I say almost because you can never be bulletproof, but the best you can. Um, have a very substantial peer. I want to say overbuild for that for sure. Um, there's no place, there, I'm going to say this equivocally, there's no place on this earth that does not have earthquakes. Yeah. No place. may not be very big, but they're there. And you know, if you spend all that time aligning your telescope up real nice, you get yourself just a smaller quake, you know, four or five, whatever, you get those vertical uh, stream waves come up, your mount now, I'm going to guarantee you, is not going to be directly for the line. So, you know, do the best you can. Here's a little picture of precision and accuracy. You know, these terms are very, very interesting. I, I happen to pick this one up off the web. There's about five or 6,000 different definitions <laughs> of accuracy, and they use the same kind of bullet pattern. But the concept's the same. It's like shooting a gun. That is an extremely accurate, extremely precise pointing of my telescope to my star. That one's horrible. It's neither accurate nor is it precise. It's off the mark. This one, believe it or not, is not too bad. You know, on average, I put it where I want. If you've got a decent sized chip and you've got a fairly decent uh, camera, you're gonna land your target pretty much on your chip and you're gonna be able to find that. Uh, software today also, nicely enough, allows you to plate solve, solve your image so you know where you are, central, right, center, and declination. And you can adjust, get yourself back over. But uh, this is a really interesting rule. A little picture kind of to, to describe this. 
Woo. OTAs, yes. You know, no matter how good your instrument uh, mounting is and all that kind of stuff, if your telescope OTA is not tight, you don't have good optics well well mounted, you're going to have flexure, you're going to have flopping of your mirror. You know, when I first started with my 14, uh, one of my first 14s anyway, I didn't understand why at the beginning of the night I was taking images over here and I was doing clips and binary work all night. So it's all night, you know, time series, 45 second entries. And the scope's going over this side. And in the morning I go out there and it's not even in the field of view. <laughs> and I'm, so, okay, why could that be? Well, I didn't really think about it, but that mirror had flopped on me. So I, I noticed it because I stayed up one night. I know, uncharacteristic of me. I stayed up one night and I watched. And when it crossed over the zenith, actually it didn't even get all the way there because there was some slot in the back there. Didn't quite reach, reach the zenith and flop. That image shifted way off and I went, ha, ah, okay, I know it's wrong. I mean, you just have to uh, diagnose those things. So that's really important. Your OTA, uh, mechanical flexures, those kinds of things taken into account. Know your system. That's probably the biggest thing is go out and play with it, learn it, know it. Uh, you can't take everything out and there's software to help you do all that stuff. But you need to know your system. Okay, thermal controls, yeah. Here's an interesting thing. Tube currents. Tube currents happen all the time, local seeing cells. You know, that's just the way the atmosphere is. That's why everything shudders when you look at it at night. That's why in those very cool nights, those very pristine nights, the stars are, are, are dead still. You don't see any kind of sunlight or, 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 or twinkling, okay? That's good seeing, very low seeing cell uh, 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 movement. Here's something people don't really think a lot about. And that's uh, observatory currents. Inside your observatory, if you've got a dome, for example, you open that aperture up, you think you're cooled down for the night, but something comes along, uh, you get a small thermal change or something like that. Now you've got all this energy that has to equalize. It's going to go out where? It's going to go out that slit. It's got to be. It's open. So you get all these two, these currents in there that ruin your images. They really do. So you've got to think about that too. I noticed that, for example, this uh, the other night when we were at the dark site. Um, that beautiful 16-inch telescope you guys have, by the way. Uh, there was a lot of, of, of dome currents in there going on because it was very hot that day and it cooled down nice with a little breeze in the evening. There was a lot of currents in there. <coughs> Think about those kinds of things when you design them. Um, we already talked about wire management. Focusing, uh, depending upon your system, depending upon your construction of your, um, your telescope and uh, the focuser itself, you may have very uh, uh, deep pockets and have the NVAR material, which is a zero expansion kind of material built into your telescope so that that thermal change doesn't affect focus at all, doesn't expand the track. Uh, I don't have that. Uh, I don't even have carbon fiber on most of my systems. It's just that nice aluminum thing I get from me, which is a wonderful cover, don't get me wrong, but you need to understand what happens to it when you change temperature by 40 degrees Fahrenheit at night. Okay, it's pretty su su uh, substantial. You get a lot of expansion contraction, so you need to focus. Now, how do you focus? You could use that nice closed loop concept we talked about. You could put it through a routine that auto focuses for you, like every 10 or 15 minutes. But it takes time out of your imaging. If you've got time critical imaging, you may not be able to pause your five minutes to do the auto focus. You may not be able to. So you decide instead to go open it because you've well characterized your focus or you know what it does on temperature. You built yourself a nice graph in Excel, for example said, okay, if I get a temperature change of four degrees, my software knows to move my focus into this new position. Trust it. I mean, that's the way you do it. You design and you trust it. That's a really wonderful way to do it. You don't lose time doing it. Auto-guiding. Wow. Do we auto-guide or don't we auto-guide? There's pros and cons that way. The methods. Do you have an off-axis guider uh, directly on your camera? Well, what about filters? Is it front or behind the filter? makes a big difference on your guide star. You won't have a guide star, I guarantee you, if you're shooting something that's a blue and you're behind an IR filter. You're just not going <laughs> to see what you expect to see. You're going to lose your guide star. Um, how about a uh, uh, parallel uh, refractor, for example, uh, mounted on top of the OTA? Another good thing, but you get a lot of flexure. You need to know what that is. But So there's a lot of controversy in how to auto-guide. If you need to auto-guide, nowadays, you know, our, our mounts are becoming pretty darn good, and they can go uh, anywhere from a minute to three minutes or even longer without auto guiding in many cases. And of course it depends upon your field of view. If you're looking at a very, very small field of view, it's going to be different than if you've got a three degree field of view. So think about those things, auto guiding too. What I'm giving you is just food for thought. 
It is. I mean, you know, there's so many things to talk about in each one of these areas that we could go on forever, but I don't have time. Power sources. Okay, this thing's remote. Do you trust that grid? You know, I don't know. I don't know. I personally don't trust the grid. But so you put some solar panels up. You put a battery bank up. You put a very small inverter with the UPS on one. UPS is an interesting thing to talk about, too. Un uninterruptible power supplies to your cameras and telescopes. Well, if your mount doesn't recover nicely when it loses power, and you have a power flash, and you have a UPS, did it pick up fast enough? Is it an offline UPS? What that means is you've got a battery sitting there charged up, but you're on line power. So as soon as the line power oscillates or, or, or a big enough variation that the system says switch to battery, it disconnects from line and goes to battery. What happened to your telescope? What happened? I mean, you need to know. You run an online UPS. Those are actually the most uh, those are probably the best kind you can have. They're very expensive, however. Um, your system and equipment always runs off of the battery through a beautiful inverter and a, 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 a controller that manages your power uh, condition. And it doesn't matter if you have power or not, line power goes out, the battery's always on, it's always supplying your system. There's no, there's no switchover. But they are expensive. Okay, uh, web power switches. These are really important for remote control. How many people have seen a web power switch? You know they are, okay. Now what they are basically is a nice box with a whole bunch of uh, electrical outlets on it and an ethernet cable you can hook into it that lets you anywhere in the world connect to that box and cycle those switches on and off. It's a wonderful device. I've got them in all my observatories, got them in Chile and everything else. Speaking of that, that computer that's running your telescope in your mount, when you lose power to it, when power comes back, what happens to it? Does it automatically start up? Or do you have to go over there four hour drive later, push the little button and go, darn, I forgot to set the automatic power cover. Those are important things to think about, and I guarantee you, you only make the mistake one time. <laughs> I guarantee you. Okay, here's another interesting thing, lightning mitigation, lightning <coughs> damage. Um, lightning goes where lightning wants to go. I don't care what you say. Engineering <laughs> has proven that you can have a very large sacrificial um, monolithic kind of building right next to your telescope. It's going to take the hit, right? No. Lightning is going to go where it wants. In fact, there's this beautiful picture on the web of this mailbox that's totally demolished, nothing but cinders, sitting right next to it, this huge flagpole, this big, uh, large uh, uh, light, you know, light out in the street, street lights, what it is. It, the lightning didn't care. It went frick at you, it went right down to that flag, that uh, mailbox and just destroyed it. It goes where it wants to go. But do take every precaution you can. Ground things well. That's a, that's a very interesting, uh, uh, controversial way to do things, to ground it. You ground your entire system together as one big group. You ground each component and then ground them together. Um, do you do, leave them ungrounded and just send your power cords out? I mean, there's so many things to think about on how you would do it. And I'm going to tell you something. You your mean? site and characteristics of your soil and your conditions you are going to be different, and I would do things differently than if I was, at, say, at Max's house, where he's got a different condition than I've got. I would have to evaluate that for what's best for me. These whole house surge uh, protectors, um, whole system surge protectors, they're wonderful. Uh, they're expensive. They're big fuses is what they are. But are they fast enough to operate and save that $20,000 CCD camera you got sitting up on top of that telescope? You put this giant all-service big O disconnect switch so when lightning shows up, you go out and go, you open power, you open your internet, you open everything. Uh, or do you do like I do? I actually run fiber optic cables from my control room, which is which is inside my, uh, my, my all my uh, electronic equipment in there. I run fiber optic out to the observatories, and then from there I distribute out local switches. I got tired of replacing those eight port Ethernet switches with lightning strikes. Not even close to me. But they're taking the switches out. So I went fiber optic everywhere. I'll tell you what, lightning cannot travel down that light path. It just doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, here's another thing to think about <coughs> internet connectivity. What kind of internet connectivity are you going to be able to get? Um, some places you can't get anything but like that wild blue satellite or, you know, satellite stuff. Now that's okay, but if, you, if that's all you can get, then you need to think about a lot of other things like how much data do I archive? Do I send all that stuff back to the internet to my home to process? Do you process it on site? All those kinds of things. Uh, that's, those are really important things to think about. I got neighbors 
And I'm in a pretty rural area. There's 200 people in my zip code. There's 19, no, 18 people in my town, I'll move down, um, from where I live. So we've got a lot of people that are on dial-up. I know it sounds archaic. Dial-up is fine if you plan for it, if you have your system designed for it. It's not a big deal. Okay. Webcams inside, outside. I said two-way audio is great. In fact, it's very, very good. Uh, building a home network, you got to you got to think about that. If you've never done it, have somebody come over that knows how to build a nice little home network for you. If you're going to set it up to, to operate that way, um, you can also do wireless out to your observatory. A lot of controversial uh, topics about wireless. Does it affect your camera? Do you get some kind of strange things going on? You know, from everybody I've talked to, anything I have done, I've been wireless. Um, first observatory, I never had a lit <coughs> trouble. Lightning doesn't travel down that wireless path either, by the way. So you don't have to worry about that as well. There's another option. Um, okay, here's here's the Dark Ridge Observatory, my observatory's network infrastructure. Okay, all this sits in the control room. Here's my fiber optic link out to the, the four observatories out here. You notice I have a computer sitting out there. Uh, I hate it. Okay, you don't have to have this kind of a complex network system at all. In fact, you can connect one cable if you want, one Ethernet cable to your computer in your house. You can run it out to the computer at the observatory if you wish to. And you can do a direct connect between your PCs. That's as simple as it, as it has to be. Even better than that, wirelessly. You got the computer out in the, in the observatory, picking up your wireless signals from in the house, and you're doing remote desktop. I mean, what could be more simple than that? So it's very, very easy to do. Okay. Here you go. Data archive. What do you do with that? <coughs> so you on that with your bandwidth. If you've, got, if you've got a T3 line to your house, I wouldn't worry about sending the raw images back. <laughs> okay? It's okay. You can do that. If you've got dial-up, you'd be lucky to send a text file. You know, for reason or not. You know something? That's what we do with APAS, believe it or not. Uh, I'll talk about APAS quickly in a few minutes, but we have systems down in Chile, we've got systems in New Mexico, we collect 20 gigabytes of data a night per camera. <coughs> Let me say it again, 20 gigabytes of data a night per camera. Well, I'm, a, I'm on a DSL line, I'm lucky, I'm one of the good guys in the 19 that has DSL, but it's only DSL, so it's really low, low speed. I can't, if I started transmitting my images back in the morning, three days later I would be done with that night. And then I've lost two now. Forget it. Don't do that. What we do, we our, our thought process says, we can't do it, so let's process all our data on site. We do it. We run it through data pipelines. We all, all we really care about for our science data is extracting the star list. It says, what star is it? What's its you know, photometric information? What flux does it have? What's the background? All that kind of stuff. That put together in a nice text file, and it takes about 15 seconds for that text file to go from my house to the AAB as well headquarters. Very, very simple, simple way to do it. Then what do we do with the images? Well, we archive everything. The rods. Every week I do brand new flats on both my systems, north and south, on all five filter channels. So we run five filter channels on each of the cells. All that stuff gets archived and saved on the computer. Well, it also gets saved on an external hard drive. They're cheap. You can get three terabyte drives now. They're very inexpensive. We fill one of those up about a month and a half. I sneaker net it through FedEx off the headquarters but I've got the original data still on my computer. When I know he's got it, uploaded the information and it's safe, I can delete it off the local computer. You just have to think about your strategy for what you're going to do there. Okay, um, yeah, time. Time is pretty darn important. How do you get your time sources synchronized? If you've got multiple systems, even if you just got a computer in your house and you got a computer out of the observatory, if you're gonna be controlling your observatory computer from the house, you better know what time it is at both machines. You better know pretty accurately <coughs> you know, some, some very intricate science work like you're going to do eclipsing binaries rotating around each other every three hours and you're looking for a third body in there which could be an exoplanet. You better have some real good time. You can get those nowadays across the internet, real nice NFTP servers in the internet to, to allow you to do that. But you can get your own GPS system, a clock, very inexpensive. You can hook it on your computer and not suddenly synchronize your clock. But it better not be inside of Mount Royal unless you've got an external antenna. Okay, just think about those kinds of things too. Um, environmental, you need to know if it's raining out. 
and I don't mean just like this. I mean, you really need to know if it's starting to get close to raining. Are you going to do up? Are you going to ruin your images? Uh, you know, there's all kinds of things. Is your wind getting so high it's about to blow your roll off roof into the next county? Roll off roofs better be secured this way also, as well as this way. <laughs> Anytime you design something, because they're a heck of a wind sail. It doesn't take much wind to lift your roll, or roll off roof right off of its uh, right. <coughs> So you got to have information about that. You got to know. Um, in my neck of the woods, uh, in the mountains, it, and it doesn't take five miles. A mile away, the weather is completely different. My neighbor's getting blasted with lightning. He's got rain coming down like crazy. I'm under clear skies over here, and I'm running my systems. So you know you got to be careful where you get your data from if you're going to trust them. something that's not on site. If you're lucky enough to have a weather station, then you can go to my weather station on my side if you wish. It's got the all sky pictures that I show you through on there. Uh, or you can go this way. This is um, Elliot Dankles, uh, really nice clear sky um, charts. These used to be clear sky clocks, but he had to change his name. And these are pretty good. This was taken last week at my house. But these are, this is another decent way to do it. And besides, you can go to USNO, I mean, uh, you can go to uh, NOAO's site and you can find out the weather information. There's weather underground, there's a lot of good stuff. If you've got people in your area, and I know there's a ton of people in this area that provide that weather information private weather stations. You can get that information too. But that's important. Know what's going to happen with your weather and it should be integrated in your system. All of my observatories are designed so that I've got one master program I wrote that manages everything. If I get any weather issues, any potential lighting issues, anything like that, it tells my system to shut down, or closes everything up and sends me a little note and says, okay, we're done for now. Now back to <coughs> Hope I'm not running too Observatory types, there's a lot of common. What are you going to put up there? What do you want? There's reasons for all of these. There really is. There's the dome. That's classic, right? I mean, if you're in a high wind environment and you've got a dome with a nice slit, you can observe without having your telescope going down somewhere. Very beneficial. Realize, though, if you live in an area like this and you open your dome up, don't stand underneath it because all the bugs are going to fall on the dome. Same with my place. I guarantee you've got this Miller Pond here where there's other kinds. Ladybugs are real big in Arizona. Okay, clamshells. You know, a clamshell is one that just kind of opens up like this, okay? In fact, that's what we're running down in CTIO at Saratoga and Chile on the prompts of clamshells. Nice part about those is you only have to open one half if you want, and then you can observe, you know, half the sky, and then the wind's over your buffeting, and you're still safe. Well, that's another good option. Clamshells are not a bad option at all. The only problem that I've really seen with clamshells, besides sometimes the mechanisms get stuck, is they come together. They come together with a seam at the top. Okay, I mean, inherently, you're going to get rain, snow, or something like that. It's going to drift down under your telescope. Where's your telescope? It's right down underneath that darn split. So, I mean, it's another thing to think about. Tip-off roofs. Those are really nice. You can just tip the whole roof back off. Uh, you can counterweight, put a counterweight on a very inexpensive uh, shelf. Uh, Tom Crashy does that. I don't know if you know his name or not, but he's, he's got like 12 of the AF, 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 AF telescopes. And put them in these little 10 uh, buildings with tip-off roofs. And they work pretty good. Uh, they're, they're a lot uh, flimsier. They're not uh, designed for, uh, for robotic remote uh, observing, but they're good for uh, around the house. My favorite is roll-offs. All my observatories are roll-offs. I'm partial. Then there's a roll-off building, like uh, the Apache Point, uh, the 2.5 meter, the entire building door opens up and it rolls off the top of the telescope, and the telescope's out in the middle of nowhere. That's really great. Uh, every one of them has positives and negatives pluses and minus on what kind you want to have. Um, here's a good one. Yearly weather pattern. Okay, when you go to your site and characterize <coughs> your site, make sure you know what your weather has been historically. Okay, now that said, our weather patterns are changing, and I think anybody that doesn't know that our weather patterns are changing will be fooling themselves, because they are. You still need to go to your site and characterize your site for weather patterns. You need to know, is it going to, am I going to have a do issue? Okay, that's a really big one. If you are, do you need new heaters? Some people have to go to the, the full extent of putting the wires, do wires on their CCD uh, windows to prevent those from doing. That's kind of extreme, but it's true. Know your know your weather system down there. Know your weather conditions. Know know when you should shut down. I'm in the middle of monsoons right now. I have been since about July 4th. I shut down from July 4th until about the end of September. Lightning, thunder, rain. You know, it's just not worth the equipment. Just shut it down. But I know that pattern, so that's when I schedule my vacations. 
Okay. Ah, let's see. Maintenance. Here's a big one. You got that nice observatory that's you know four hours away. Do you have anybody over there that can help you out? Did you meet a friend? Did you sit in a cafe down there at the local uh, community and, and meet somebody that's interested in astronomy that would be willing to help you out with your observatory in the middle of the night? Something goes wrong. Rain starts coming down. Your roof didn't close. Can you go out and shut it for you? I mean, you need to think about this. Take every action you can so you don't have to have human intervention, but it's going to have to happen. And they don't have to be big things, they can be little things, you know. The computer can freeze up, something simple like that could ruin your whole night. Um, how about the troubleshooting process if something does go wrong? Uh, what, you really don't want to do this, but have a plan. <laughs> <laughs> you just got to have a, the idea is you've got a plan. I mean, you, you thought through it, you know what, you, what to do. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Throw it away, of course. <laughs> okay. I'm, 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 I'm. There's software um, uh, bugs. Every piece of software written, every piece of code written that I know of, including the government, has bugs. If you find bugs, report them. That's the only way that the, the, the software author is going to be able to help us get them fixed. And the sooner you report them, with as much detail and information as you possibly can about all your conditions at the time of the problem, the easier he's going to. Uh, be able to solve your problem. Get in there and do that. Um, software beta testing. Uh, okay, there are people that like to beta test. Um, I personally, if it was my own equipment for my own observing fun, I would do it. Because I like to help people make their products. If it happens to be like the APAS uh, All Sky Photometric Survey, we version locked everything in October of 2010 and we've not allowed one piece of software to be updated since then. Because we have a completely working close to bulletproof system sitting there that we know is going to work. Microsoft isn't helping us out with updates. My antivirus software is not helping out with updates. Maxim, you know, whatever it happens to be. They're trying their best to help you, but I guarantee you, if you don't test it end to end, you're going to find a problem. It's going to end at the worst time, I guarantee you. So software beta testing is a wonderful thing if you can do it. If you can, it's fine. And don't, don't do it. Off the store, uh, off the shelf automation software, it's there, it's really good. It's getting much, much better every year. They're coming out with better products to do that. Um, we, uh, with our project, uh, APAS, the ABSO, and I, dec I decided that what we're going to do is we're going to build a system of off the shelf products. We've got better support. Somebody will come help us if we need to. For example, we lost one of our U16M camera CCD chips down at, uh, at Chile uh, about a year and a half ago. Blew a big old hole in the chip. Well, I don't mean literally blew a hole, but there was nothing in that area of the chip. And these are big 57 millimeter on diagonal chips, 4K by 4K CCDs. So, Apogee, I'll tell you what, you know, I, Tim's a nice guy, and I meet him and talk with him a lot. Those guys, if you, if you talk to them, they will respond in a heartbeat. We got our cameras to them. They had to buy, they had to order brand new chips to be, to be made, because they don't make those chips, they're not on the shelf. We had it ordered, had it made, had it back to us within about a month and a half. We only lost a little sort of the sky down each other. Off the shelf stuff is good. Warranty support's great. People are in it. It's much more uh, robust than it used to be. It used to buy a byproduct, and sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. They're much, much better now. Also, if you're if you're like me, I mean, part of my hobby is software writing and integration and making things work and, uh, and I love it. Uh, program your own stuff. Yeah, it's a, it's a great way to do meaningful control. Okay, partial references, I'll put them on your website. Uh, you'll have a, a list of a bunch of uh, stuff. Um, this is APAS, shifting gears real now. APAS is the uh, ABSO's Photometric All Sky Survey. Um, I run a telescope up at uh, New Mexico. Uh, I also run uh, the telescope down in Chile. Um, Arnie Hannon, the director of ABSO, I finally got him where he can run it down there in Chile so I don't have to run both at the same time, which is a really nice thing. This survey is designed to be a photometric all sky. Think about that. Every area of the sky will have photometric standards and stars in it. Not like Landall standards. Anybody familiar with the Landall standards and that kind of stuff for photometry? Any place you point your CCD camera, and I don't care how small your field of view is, I'm going to have calibrated photometric stars in there for you to determine exact magnitudes in the, in the field of view over the entire sky. Okay. This is uh, New Mexico. This is my site. This is my site, New Mexico. Hey, look at that pile of equipment back there. 
I talked about cable wrap, and cable runs through, through the, uh, the mount. All that stuff is run through cables that go through the mount. This is Chile, CTIO Chile. It's the one I built first and took down there. Um, I was going to pass around something, but I don't think everybody got time. These, like I said, this is the way I do my back building with these lights. They're in banks. They're incandescent banks of lights that I turn on and turn off as I need to to illuminate that particular disc for that particular camera and that filter assembly. Uh, it's automated, it's programmed, uh, <coughs> you know, it's not descriptive itself. So, and it goes through and figures out exactly what bank to turn on. Does an integration, verifies the ADU counts are correct or flat. Does that as many times as I need, moves to the next filter, adjusting. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, and that's why I have the targets like that. Okay, quick uh, recap on ABSO where we're at today. 2010 is when I built the system, the first one at my, my site. Um, we've now covered basically 95% of the sky. Our last release was June 8th this year. 95% of the sky. The only reason we didn't get more, down here in the southern hemisphere, this is where we lost the ship uh, down on that camera. And up here was uh, weather pattern issues in the north of my place, so I had to shut down. <coughs> But 95% of the sky, you think about that for a few minutes. That's a huge area. That's a huge area. We visited each one of those locations at least twice so far to be counted as a, as a, as a site. We have over 42 million stars right now with photometry information on it. And our last release, uh, well, our next release, we'll have a couple more and we'll be finished up. Our last release came out, like I said, June 8th. The, uh, the UCAT 4 catalog was held up because we're putting eight past uh, data in. It's now been incorporated in it. You're going to have astrometry, you're going to have photometry in one catalog that marries the Tyco and the Sloan systems because we're running Sloan filters in the APAS. We're also running Johnson Cousins standard filters. We're running between magnitude 12 or 10 and magnitude 17. So that's the range the catalog of stars for you. Uh, uh, Sloan picks up just after us, and Tyco comes just before us, and it's about 9, 9 and a half, 10. So now you've got full coverage of all that. Um, 2010 has started. We've got about a year left to go if everything goes right. And then, I don't know what I'm going to do then. Maybe I'll have to go to another resort. <laughs> okay, this is who funded uh, APAS, uh, the Robert uh, Madden Air Science Foundation, and of course, endowments from the ABSO. This is an ABSO project, uh, American Association of the Star Observers, if you know what that was. Um, Arnie came to me and said, can I use your site? And I said, not unless I can build it. And so I built this equipment. I love it. It's great. It's keeping me occupied, basically uh, full time. But I'm waiting for, for it to finish. So with that, are there questions? And please, thank you very much, Texas Astronomical Society, for inviting me to talk to you. This has been fun. You know, I've got to hear things today. I got to see young students get awards. I mean, the new people that stood up here at the beginning said so they're novice. I'm a novice. I guarantee you, I've got a lot to learn. And anybody that doesn't think you've got something to learn in astronomy, school yourself, I mean, just lay back with a pair of binoculars one night in an easy chair, look up, and you're going to learn something, I guarantee you. Questions, please. Anything. Sorry I went so long. Yes, sir. Uh, on these remote sites, Yes, the sites uh, that I operate and, and that you all should have, have uh, as well have a full weather uh, package built on it. I've got rain, wind, um, I've got an all-sky camera look at the cloud conditions. I've got a sky quality meter that tells me the conditions of the sky. Someone in the, in the, the group uh, has a sky quality meter they wanted to talk about. I brought lots of data. I've got data from a long time ago. All those things integrate into my control system that I wrote. Not that you have to. Because things, for example, like uh, Bob Denny's ACP program has a weather input to it. So it gets a, it gets a boolean. Is my weather good or is my weather bad? And it takes actions based upon that. Yeah, you need to know what they are. But not only do you need to know that I shut myself down I'm safe, you know, I don't want to lose the whole night. When the system clears up and I get repetitive good readings for a period of time, 10 minutes is my default right now, I'll say it's good. Open back up. Start back up. These dynamic schedules will start me back up again and I'm back in business. Very good question. Any more, please? 
Yes, sir. I guess I was the one that, when I think about things going wrong, but it seems that your answer is you always find somebody who can drive up the hill and bail you out. Not always. You end up having to do it yourself, or sometimes if you're lucky, you can put your equipment in a safe condition and just park it until you got time. You know, that's the best. That really is, is the ultimate goal anyway, is to make it safe up there. Uh, your equipment, it's expensive for us to operate these things. No, you can't always get somebody to drive up there. I'm really lucky in Chile. Um, I know the maintenance engineer down there, and he's got a beautiful shop, and he takes care of all the things. We go up and ask him to tweak this telescope this way a little bit or change this filter. He's on the spot, he reports back to us, that kind of stuff. Um, in my case, I'm the maintenance guy. Uh, I, I go out and paint the buildings, I do all the, the, the lubing of all the chain drives, everything myself, because I like doing it. But you don't have to. In fact, when I go on vacation, if I'm operating, by the way, I, I can operate from my network or laptop or iPad anywhere in the world and run the system without any kind of anything, which is wonderful. But I've got somebody, a friend, that lives not too far away, and within 15, 20 minutes could be in my place. I've got my procedures, detailed procedures on the walls, in the observatories that says, touch this first, touch that next, touch that, to put it in the safe condition. Call me, phone number's on there, backup phone number's there too, tell me what it's safe. So I guess the answer to your question is you can't always have somebody drive up, you have to do it yourself. And if you've got a friend, even if you don't have a friend, let me tell you something. Three o'clock in the morning when that lightning strike hit, rain's starting to come down and, and you've got to run out to your observatory. It's only 300 feet away from your house. You're tired. You're asleep. You better have a procedure and you better know step by step how to shut that thing down quickly because if you don't, the next lightning strike may take out, well, hopefully not you. <laughs> <laughs> but something, okay? So, you know, I, I can't harp enough about having good operating procedures whenever you have any kind of equipment. Any kind of equipment. I don't care what it is. It's really important. That answer your question? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, could you just make a quick comment about operating system stability? How do you... Uh, How do you maintain... What's been your experience so nowadays? Okay. Well, uh, we've had a lot of failures uh, in some equipment and things, and that's really why I built the first system like I did for the A-Pass, for example. The first system was built on my site, and I, I, I validated it. I went through and I, I bnb the entire process um, until we were satisfied we could take it down there. Uh, uptime, I want to say 99.9% .9 we been up. We have some occasional problems. You know, it happens. Uh, especially with a complex system like A-Pass. I run one Linux machine, which is has on it two virtual Windows XP machines. Each virtual Windows XP machine runs one of the telescopes, one of the filter wheels, one of the cameras, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. So you get you get some glitches, no doubt about it. We've had really good success, and you know, something that really makes me feel comfortable is uh, my quote-unquote morning report. The software system that we've designed reports back to us and tells us what we've got, sends Starless to us, says, Everything ran fine, you had no failures. You wore, gee, this was a failure, this is the action that was taken, it logs it all for us. So those are really important things to make you feel good about, getting your equipment so you can trust it or not. Any others? I have a last question for you. Max said that you might comment about our facilities up in Oklahoma. Do you care to say anything? Absolutely, you've got a wonderful site up there. I wish that I had a whole busload of people I could take up there and, and do continual star parties with. You know, that, that site is, is pristine. Um, you have weather like everybody else, but you've got a wonderful um, you know, sky horizon up there. It's a dark site. You've got power. You've got pads. You've got that wonderful bunkhouse. I mean, if you need to go up there, you've got that great observatory. You've got that cooking facility. You've got that great place you have picnics. Man, I wished I had that when I was in California. You know, I may consider building something like that up at my place. I've only got about a quarter mile of reach. It's still open. I might do that. Oh, yeah. It's very interesting. Uh, yeah, I love your site. I really do. And I wish you all would take more man. I wish you'd get more students up there, kids. Take them up in packs and roads. We have we issues transporting children across state lines. <laughs> 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 their, their parents don't. I know. Okay, that's you know the biggest, the biggest, the biggest, the biggest promoter of, of astronomy for me is parents. You know, and that's the way we rely on the community. Education for your kids. Get your parents involved because if they're not involved, 
Right. You know, the kids are going to get involved to a point. But, you know, they take it back and they're talking about it on the way driving back home. Can you imagine? Wow, I saw Saturn, I heard. You know, got to see Saturn in the eye. What a great thing. Yeah, absolutely. You got a wonderful slide. Thank you very much for allowing me and Max to go up there and share. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.